Welcome to the YouTube channel of Renaissance English History Podcast. I have my helper today. I'm Hannah. I, her, she's my mom. I'm her mom. And what's special about today? Today's my birthday. Hannah's birthday. And I'm turning Hannah. Hannah's turning 10. But currently, right now, when we are making this video, you are probably not watching it right now because, I mean, it's not even out now. But right now, mom would still have been in agony. No epidural. All natural. I was so silly. Um, I yeah. popped out. 20, 25 hours. 20 hours. I'm going to pop out. What time is it now? Okay, this is getting way too personal. Okay. So, Hannah, what are we talking about today? Let me tell you what we're talking about. Let's pull up these notes. I don't know what we're talking about today, Mom. We are talking about the relationship with Anne Boleyn. Do you remember who she is? Kind of, she's one of Henry VIII's wives. Right. Do you know which one she is? Mom? Don't tell me. You're not my cheat sheet. I was going to say the third, but you just told me that she is the second. Yeah, so she's the one that Henry left yeah, Catherine of Aragon for. So she, we're going to talk about her relationship with Cardinal Wolsey. Who's that? Is she a bird? <laughs> is she a cardinal? No, but you know why they <laughs> called them that? Because they had these cardinals hats that were red and they wore these red outfits. I mean, I think that has to do with it. Somebody's here is probably going to leave me a comment and tell me that's wrong. But as far as I know, that's what it comes from. And he was a religious uh, advisor, but he was also Henry's Lord Chancellor. He was kind of Henry's right-hand man. Okay. Like Hamilton was Washington's right-hand man. Cool. Okay. Real quick so, before you get into yeah? it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I got this necklace for my birthday, and it's yeah. an opal. And I'm going to go watch TV now. Okay, well, wait. Don't you want to have me do... If you're new here, very special warm welcome to you right there. Yeah. I'm your host, Heather. This is... Hannah Tesco. And I've been podcasting on Tudor England since 2009, before you were even born, child. And that was four years before I was born. It was. This is the channel where I put all of my Content. episodes from my various podcasts. As well as loads of extra content like this video right here. And what should they do if they haven't already? Subscribe and smash that right button. Wow. All right. <laughs> Happy birthday. Bye. All right. So I'm going to record for a couple minutes, okay? Before we get started, some of you know that I have books. I make books. I publish books. And this is one of the first ones I wrote, Sideways and Backwards, A Journey, Time Travel, and Self-Discovery. Um, and it's by me and I published it in 2016. Anyway, I'm giving out five copies of this to subscribers of this channel. So if you are not subscribed to this channel and you would like a, I'm going to sign it too. I'll sign it. You would like a signed copy of my book. Um, it's about, I'll read you the back. Natasha Delancourt, the editor in chief of a large publishing company wakes up in the morning after Halloween with a massive hangover. She also has a huge problem and a compromising photo of her from the night before it went viral. Advised by her company PR to get out of London and turn off her phone, she takes the train to Cambridge for a weekend of self-imposed quiet reflection. Determined to figure out how her life has gone so sideways and how she can start fresh, she makes an afternoon pilgrimage to Evensong service at King's College, an ancient chapel in the heart of Cambridge. Then things start to get strange, really strange. Feeling moved by the music and surroundings, she closes her eyes in quiet meditation, and then the world gets dark. She wakes up in the same place, but a very, very different time. <laughs> so that is our friend, Natasha. She uh, goes back in time. It's like a time slip sort of book. So I wouldn't call it, it's not historical fiction. It's more like, yeah, time slip. So anyway, if you would like a signed copy, just make sure you're subscribed. And at the end of the, at the end of the week, next Monday, August 14th, I'm going to choose five random subscribers and contact them and arrange to send them copies of my book. All right, cool, let's get into it. In the vibrant tapestry of Tudor history, few relationships have influenced England's trajectory as profoundly as the intriguing interplay between Anne Boleyn and Cardinal Thomas Woolsey, and the captivating lady-in-waiting who would become the second wife of Henry VIII, and Woolsey, the powerful prelate who dominated England's political and religious landscape, they were pivotal figures in one of history's most dramatic tales. So in this video, we're going to journey through the opulent halls of the Tudor court, where ambition, desire, and fate intertwine, setting the stage for monumental change. 
So let's start with the background on Thomas Woolsey. His story is one of a meteoric rise to power from humble beginnings to the echelons of England's elite. Born in Ipswich to a butcher and his wife, Woolsey's intellect and ambition propelled him far beyond the confines of his modest upbringing. He was educated at Oxford. He was lauded as a prodigious scholar, earning the nickname the Boy Bachelor for his academic achievements at the tender age of just 15 years old. But it was in the realm of politics and church affairs where Woolsey truly made his mark. Henry VII recognized his talent, setting Woolsey on a path of increasing prominence. By the time young King Henry VIII ascended the throne, Woolsey had become an indispensable asset. Their partnership was founded on mutual respect and trust. While Henry indulged in the pleasures of kingship, Woolsey managed the intricacies of governance. In essence, he was England's de facto ruler. His positions were manifold. He was the Archbishop of York. He was the Lord Chancellor of England. And perhaps most significantly, he was the papal legate, a direct representative of the Pope in Rome. This last title granted him unparalleled religious authority in England, second only to the Pope himself. Yet with all of his power, he was not immune to the shifting sands of court politics or the whims of a king in search of a male heir. As the 1520s dawned, a new figure began to cast a long shadow over the English court, and that would be Anne Boleyn. Little did Woolsey know that his fate and Anne's ambitions would soon become linked. Anne Boleyn's return to the court from France in the 1520s and the early 1520s was marked by grace, intelligence, and a distinct French flair a testament to her time spent in the courts of Burgundy, the Netherlands, and, of course, France. Her European sojourn had shaped her into a sophisticated and alluring presence, captivating the attentions of many, including a young nobleman named Henry Percy. Their budding relationship filled with the promise of love was abruptly cut short. The general consensus at court was that Woolsey had played a significant role in ending their courtship. Cavendish said that Henry himself had ordered it ended because he already was starting to feel feelings for Anne. Um, Percy already had marriage plans. So, you know, there was a, a couple of things. It wasn't just that Woolsey didn't like Anne, uh, but you know, Anne blamed him for that, definitely. And her ire with Woolsey began in earnest with this intervention. She felt wronged her personal life manipulated for political reasons. Yet, as one door closed, another opened. Henry VIII was already getting restless in his marriage to Catherine of Aragon due to you know, many things, including her inability to produce a male heir. And he became increasingly enamored with Anne. And here, Anne, of course, demonstrated her astuteness. Unlike her sister, she refused to be a mere mistress, subtly asserting her worth and stoking the king's desire even further. As their relationship deepened, the pressing matter of Henry's annulment from Catherine became the court's primary preoccupation. For Henry, the annulment was not just a matter of the heart, but also of dynasty. His desperation for a male heir, coupled with his infatuation for Anne, pushed the great matter to the forefront of England's political agenda. And as the king's most trusted advisor, Woolsey was entrusted with this sensitive task. Given Woolsey's dual role as both the king's chief minister and the papal legate, Henry assumed that the annulment would be a relatively straightforward affair. However, the process proved anything but simple. The Pope was under significant pressure from the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, who was, of course, Catherine's nephew, and was reluctant to annul the marriage. Additionally, the sack of Rome in 1527 by Charles's troops further complicated matters as the Pope was virtually a prisoner and couldn't make independent decisions. The months turned into years, Anne's patience wore thin. She had already experienced Woolsey's interference in her relationship with Percy. Now she perceived his inability to secure the annulment as yet another betrayal. While Woolsey genuinely tried to navigate the complex web of European politics, his efforts were continually thwarted. Anne's growing influence over Henry, combined with Woolsey's perceived failures, set the stage for the inevitable clash. Their intertwined destinies would play a decisive role in the unfolding drama of the Tudor court. The woman once seen as an unsuitable match for Henry Percy was now at the heart of English political life, wielding influence few could have predicted. 
Anne Boleyn's growing presence in Henry's life had ramifications beyond their intimate relationship. It began to permeate the very politics of court. Anne's animosity towards Woolsey was, of course, multifaceted. She was still upset with him about messing up with her romance with Henry Percy. And you know, as the annulment dragged on, she became ever more convinced that Woolsey was actually acting against her. She wasn't alone in her mistrust. Court gossip and whisperings of Woolsey's other political adversaries found a willing audience in her. Together, they painted a portrait of Woolsey as a self-serving prelate, more interested in his own power than in the king's desires. Moreover, Anne began introducing Henry to reformist religious ideas, subtly challenging Woolsey's staunch Catholic beliefs. The religious divide between them further strained their relationship with Anne, subtly suggesting that perhaps Woolsey's loyalty to Rome was greater than his loyalty to the English crown. By the late 1520s, his star was waning. His failure to secure the annulment was seen not just as a personal failure, but a diplomatic and political one as well. Henry's frustrations with him were clear, and Anne, with her growing influence over the king, was well positioned to exacerbate these tensions. Anne's alliances within the court played a pivotal role. She fostered close ties with Woolsey's political enemies, including the Duke of Norfolk and the Boleyn family's own connections highlighting his luxurious lifestyle, which, you know, didn't seem like that of a prelate or a man of God. By 1529, the inevitable occurred. Wolsey was dismissed from his position as Lord Chancellor, replaced by Sir Thomas More. Stripped of his properties and wealth, he was ordered to retire in York. But even in his reduced state, his enemies were not done. In 1530, he was arrested on charges of treason. He was supposedly writing letters to Catherine of Aragon. Although he would never stand trial, dying en route to London, Woolsey's downfall was complete. Anne's triumph was clear. The man who once stood in her way, both in matters of the heart and politics, was gone. But the English court was a place of shifting alliances and tumultuous affairs. As Woolsey's star set, Anne's own fate was on the rise with the challenges and triumphs of her own awaiting. The intense interplay between Anne and Cardinal Woolsey had profound implications for England. Woolsey's downfall not only highlighted the volatile nature of court politics, but also demonstrated the immense power of an individual, in this case, Anne, and the role she could have over the monarch and the nation's entire direction. With Woolsey out of the way, the path to Henry's break from the Catholic Church became more unobstructed. Anne's reformist beliefs and her influence over Henry contributed to the eventual establishment of the Church of England. This monumental shift was not just about Henry's desire for a male heir or his love for Anne. It also stemmed from the political and religious tensions of the era, with figures like Anne and Woolsey at the very heart. For Anne, her victory over Woolsey was bittersweet. She did become Queen of England and give birth to Elizabeth I. Her time on the throne was fraught with challenges. Her inability to produce a male heir coupled with the court intrigues and the fickle nature of Henry's affections would eventually lead to her own tragic end. The relationship between Anne and Thomas Woolsey is a microcosm of broader intrigues, passions, and political maneuverings in the Tudor era. Their personal feud reflects the larger struggles of the time, from the quest for power to the religious upheavals that would shape England for centuries. In the annals of history, their names are forever intertwined. A reminder of a time when love, ambition, and destiny emerged in the halls of the Tudor court. So thank you so much for watching. If you've made it to the end of this video and enjoyed it, I hope I earned a press of that like button and a subscription to my channel where I put out content like this almost every day. Don't forget to subscribe so you're entered into the contest to win one of my books. And thank you so, so much for watching. I just want to remind you that you are special. You are awesome. You are deeply, deeply loved. Whatever you're doing right now, you are important. And I am so glad that you are here, not just because you watch my video. Thanks so much for watching. Have a fantastic day.